So this is where we left off. Sometimes the immune system does some malfunctioning. We're not exactly sure why. So this is what one example would be allergies. And allergies are getting to be a much bigger issue, increasingly so in the United States. And um, it is hypothesized some of that is in relationship to we eat a lot more processed foods. We have a lot more chemicals that are not as regulated in our country as they are in other countries. So for example, if you looked at a type of shampoo in the United States and in the European Union, the European Union has a lot more regulations on chemicals. And so those two formulas of the same exact brand and kind of shampoo, the formulas will be different. Why the company just doesn't say, okay, let's go with the less toxic version of this shampoo across the board. I'm not really sure. Could be something to do with money, um, but I'm not exactly sure why they just wouldn't say, oh, the European Union says we can't have these certain chemicals uh, available to the public. And the United States says, well, fine, we can have them why they wouldn't just make one universal type of shampoo for that same kind and of that brand. So a lot more toxins in our environment in general, and that's just one of many examples. In the next unit, we'll talk about endocrine disruptors, how there's many toxic chemicals in our lives that mess up our endocrine system. In your endocrine system are all these chemical messengers inside of your body that regulate processes that happen, important processes that happen. So is there a relationship between toxicity in our environment and allergies? Hypothetically, yes. So what happens is, is that your body looks at a substance that is typically for most bodies, not anything dangerous, and it says, let's make a full-blown immune response. That means war, right? so that your body goes to war with something like pollen or a peanut, and it wages this huge war against that substance. Typically when we're talking about these substances, they are not harmful. But a peanut, something as simple as a nut, can become life-threatening to a person. If we looked back 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 1,000 years ago to our ancestors, they would probably think it was crazy that nuts would cause death in some people. So all kinds of different allergens. They're not just, a lot of times we might think of allergies as seasonal allergies like breathing. I know some of you have seasonal allergies. Could be bees or wasps. Their venom, some people just react differently. Milk, eggs, fish, wheat, tree nuts, peanuts. So there's lots and lots of different allergies out there. Typically what we find is that majorly allergies will have a relationship to the respiratory system and the digestive system. And so we have those kind of two major forms of allergies, but there certainly are others as well. what happens is that your body treats something that's not typically dangerous as an antigen, which means that then your body treats the allergen in a way that causes an immune response to create antibodies against it. And again, then wages that full adaptive immune response war. Many of your allergens then cause the mast cells to secrete histamine. And if you remember a little bit about that inflammation response that the mast cells are going to release the chemical histamine to that area, which is going to stimulate more blood flow, more water flow, more blood cells, and specifically the white blood cells to that area. So it's causing this big response. We're learning more and more about 
inflammation and how dangerous and harmful inflammation is to our body. So very kind of recently, maybe in the last five to 10 years, and especially you're seeing a lot more, especially now making its way to the news, is that inflammation is something that can accelerate aging, can accelerate diseases to be far more harmful. So that histamine, you're probably a little bit more familiar with histamine in terms of taking an antihistamine for respiratory type allergies, those seasonal allergies. And that's going to allow the lungs to have less water in the lungs. We breathe air, not water. And so an accumulation of water is gonna cause heavier breathing. That's one of the things that happens with someone who has heart failure is that their lungs start to fill with water and they internally start to drown. So an antihistamine is going to reduce that process from happening. Also, the histamine is going to increase the amount of mucus. And we know just with breathing, when you get sick, the production of mucus is going to hinder your ability to breathe. We'll talk about the respiratory system, that the smallest functioning parts of your respiratory system are sacs called alveoli, and those sacs have a covering of blood vessels that allow for oxygen to be diffused in to the blood cells, to the blood, I should say, in general, and carbon dioxide out. So if you have mucus around that environment, it's going to not allow the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. And we know we need that for metabolism. Food allergies can cause this internally. So more mucus production. Again, mucus, water, we're gonna get in the way of diffusion of your nutrients into the blood system. Remember looking at the mesentery the other day, when you look at the small intestines, they are held in place by connective tissue that is infused with blood vessels. And you see all of those blood vessels in there, right? And so all of that small intestine there, one of the longest organs in the body, it has blood vessels. And so that should kind of make that clue to you that the blood vessels are taking nutrients from the small intestine into the blood and then distributing those nutrients energy around the body. So if you have again an increase in water and especially mucus in the digestive system, it's gonna interfere with the absorption of nutrients and energy. Some of the ways that bodies respond to that is an increase in um, kind of watering down of the feces, which might cause diarrhea. A lot of people in reaction to having this chain of events, the histamine and the extra water and mucus, they have a lot of cramping in their digestive system. It's very uncomfortable for them. So again, remembering that this, whatever it is, like this is pollen, for example, something that typically wouldn't cause a reaction by the immune system, but for many of us it does. Our body reacts in a way that causes this to be thought by the immune system as something more dangerous, something we need to fight off. So it's going to cause the mast cells to release histamine. In response, the mast cells are going to make antibodies, then stimulate the copying of those mast cells into plasma cells. And those plasma cells, if you remember, they're going to start pumping out antibodies so that those antibodies can bind with antibodies to the pollen antigens inside of your body and then we're going to have those phagocytic cells come and they're going to gobble that up so we have an immune response happening. War causes and a lot of times when you have those allergy responses like seasonal allergies not only might you have a little bit heavier breathing because you've got an accumulation of more water and mucus in your lungs, but also because you have this war going on, you're gonna feel more tired. And again, for what? 
just some kind of factor you have, probably a genetic factor or an environmental factor that makes you react to this in a way that many other people don't. Some people have autoimmune diseases, so here's another malfunction of the immune system, and it causes your body these reactions, maybe genetic factors, and again, maybe environmental or combination of the two, causes your body to attack its own cells. Autoimmune diseases, there's a wide variety of them. They treat your body like your own cells, like they're not your own cells. So we call those like anti-self cells, right? Your MHCs are not matching up in the right way. So for whatever reason, your body attacks your own body. So like we talked about with organ transplant, that you need those cells, right? You need that organ and then your body's attacking it because the MHCs don't match enough. Here's a case where it's your own cells attacking your own cells. So this is like really wacky in terms of the function of the immune system. It's a big malfunction here. So let's talk about a few examples. So type one diabetes. Type one diabetes affects the insulin secreting cells of the pancreas. thus causing them not to produce insulin. Insulin, oh, that's all I've got about it. Okay, so just a little bit about insulin. Insulin is a chemical in our body that is going to help the nutrients and energy in the blood to get into the cells. So they're kind of like here, especially glucose, get into the cells. And so it's gonna allow that. It's gonna be just like uh, maybe a tour guide in the blood. That says, oh, glucose, here you go. Go into the cells. If you don't have insulin, you don't have that helper to get the sugar and other nutrients into your blood, into your cells from the blood. And so it's gonna stay there. That's why people who are diabetic, they have to test their blood numerous times a day so that they can see the levels of sugar in their blood. And then they know how much insulin they're going to have to inject physically put into their body because they don't produce it themselves. So they inject that insulin who's gonna then be in the body and then get that sugar and other nutrients into their bloodstream so they can test that throughout the day. Some people have pumps. They have a little pump that's on their um, belt and it just monitors all that for them. And some people prefer not to have that because it's just a thing to maybe get caught on stuff. Um, you also have to have a port that goes into your body and so just a little bit more maybe uncomfortable for some people and some people like to just test it themselves and then inject the insulin throughout the day. Um, I was gonna say one more thing about that and I can't think of it. All right, so let's talk about other immune, autoimmune diseases. Rheumatoid arthritis. This is where your immune system is going to attack your joints. Myothenia gravis attacks the skeletal muscles. Multiple sclerosis, MS, attacks the central nervous system. Lupus, this was an interesting one that I find that when a physician can't figure out what's going on with someone, they have pain, they have weird symptoms, they'll say, I bet it's lupus. So lupus is kind of almost like a, here's a mystery thing. There's things they know about lupus and then sometimes you have a combination of weird symptoms and they might just say, well, that's lupus. So a lot of these, as you can imagine, very difficult to deal with. Very important parts of the body, right? We're talking about the joints, you have anywhere you bend in your body, you have a joint will cause a lot of pain, discomfort, inability to do everyday things, like even just writing. Some people who have rheumatoid arthritis, they have a hard time just picking up a pen and writing, walking. People who have issues with their central nervous system, which a lot of times lupus and MS, they overlap a bit, um, it's gonna be problems with muscle uncomfortableness, pain, inability to walk and move and function, maybe headaches. Uh, all of these diseases are genetic 
um, yes and maybe and no. <laughs> so um, some of this is a little bit of mystery. There's a lot of problems to solve here in terms of um, sometimes they'll see, like when you're talking about diabetes, sometimes you'll see it clearly running through a family. And sometimes there's a person who no genetic history in the past of a family and someone pops up with diabetes. Same thing with a lot of these too. So sometimes there is a genetic history and then sometimes someone pops up and it could be just that the combination of genes most of the time when we're talking about traits that we have, it's typically not like one trait causes, sorry, one gene causes one trait. It's usually a combination of many genes cause a trait. And so that in saying like rheumatoid arthritis, for example, there might be 50 genes that code for someone having rheumatoid arthritis, combinations of those. And the possibility of people having those genes and passing them down for many generations and no one ever showing the trait of rheumatoid arthritis, yeah, that could happen if you have 50 genes that are in the process of coding for having it or not having it. And so maybe one person in a hundred in a family pops up with it. Is that likely? Yeah. So um, there's a lot to figure out in terms of genetic factors because traits are so complex. We, um, I know if you took Bio 111, it's a real surface level of like, here's one, you get an example of these one gene combinations cause this one trait. And even over time, since I've been working here, a lot of the genes that we have used in Bio 111, I've had to turn around and say, well, I've read that now this one's been ruled out to be a one gene, one trait. And one of the ones that we know about still, most of them have been ruled out. Um, handedness is still one that we have seen that it appears to be one gene for one trait. But most traits, combination of many genes. So it gets complex. So the answer is, again, yes, maybe no. <laughs> There are no known cures for autoimmune disease. There are ways to maybe alleviate symptoms and to help with symptoms. So definitely, if you're a puzzle, if you're somebody who likes puzzles, there's lots of puzzles to solve in the medical fields. Replacement therapy, like replacement therapy would be an example of diabetes, is that where your body doesn't produce insulin anymore, it can be replaced with insulin that's made. Oh, I know I wanted to tell you about it. So super, I think this is super fascinating. The history of the production of insulin replacement for people who have diabetes. So a long time ago, before we have current, and I'll talk about the current ways that uh, um, insulin is produced, but a long time ago, before we had the more modern methods of insulin production, they used to extract insulin from dead people. <laughs> yeah, the reaction fight. So that when people died, they would basically, and I don't know how they did it, I don't know if they like, squeeze the pancreas, I'm sure that's not it. Ring it but, <laughs> ring it out. Um, but they would extract the insulin from dead people and then give that to diabetics. They were, you know, that's hard. There's only so many dead people. So being diabetic, very dangerous in the past. Somebody figured out that they can take the genes. So remember bacterial cells, they have a main chromosome called a nucleoid, but they also have little teeny plasmids that also have DNA. So little teeny circles of DNA. And somebody brilliantly figured out that they could take the gene for insulin production, or the, I shouldn't say a gene, it's genes, the gene combination, and stick it into one of a bacterial plasmid. And then when the bacteria, they would replicate this particular gene combination and they would pump out, the bacteria would begin to pump out insulin. And so now here's a case of, we have a transgenic organism where a gene from one organism is inserted into another one. And this organism, this bacterial cell, single-celled organism, is pumping out insulin for
for people who are diabetic. That's pretty cool, right? So there's a really neat gene technology, bioengineering, where maybe in these other types of diseases, they can figure out some kind of replacement therapy use another organism. So lots of cool research going on. There's also ways to use immunosuppressant drugs to try and make the immune system not overreact. But again, remember that if you're on immunosuppressant drugs, that also opens you up not only to your own body being fooled into not attacking itself, it opens you up to other factors coming into your body and then overwhelming your body. So bacterial infections, viral infections, cancers in your body. So it's not necessarily the best solution either. So let's talk about exotic flu viruses spreading. So we know COVID's going on right now. In the past, there have been other flus and typically with any kind of flu, it's caused by a viral particle. That viral particle gets into its host organism and humans are not the only hosts. In the past, we've had to deal with the avian flu, the bird flu and the swine flu have spread around the world. And with infection as the host, whether we're talking about a pig or a swine, um, there's been a lot of hypotheses about COVID maybe coming from a bat originally. We don't hear about it anymore because we're kind of moved on to, well, we got it, so let's try and fix it. But um, when those viruses get into their host, your cells reproduce them and pump them out quickly. And then as they go from host to host, because a virus is not a cell itself, so it's not even a bacterium, it's just a particle. Remember back in the last unit, we talked about a virus only has to have two things. It has to have some kind of protein and it has to have um, some kind of genetic material. And so they can't reproduce themselves because they're not a living thing. But when they get into a living thing, they interfere or they get into our genetics and then they tell our cells to start pumping out more. And when our body is programmed by the virus to do that quickly, mistakes can be made. And that's what we're getting mutations, especially like with COVID, is that we start to get these mutations over time. Sometimes these mutations, so like the hypothesis that COVID the coronavirus came from a bat. Here we have crossing species boundaries. So this doesn't happen super often. It's not extremely common, but it can happen. There's also the hypothesis that HIV came from um, some other primate besides humans and it crossed the species barrier. So what can happen is that because like, for example, vertebrates, we see this or we I should say we pay more attention to it in the vertebrates because we are a vertebrate that things like birds and pigs and bats, maybe rats in the past, can pass a virus to another species is because we share many genes with other vertebrates. So different antigens for these exotic flus then our regular seasonal flu. We didn't hear hardly anything about the seasonal flu last year because everybody was in quarantine. Everybody was pretty locked down. Everybody was wearing masks. So it didn't spread very much. We didn't hear about, you know, usually in the late fall through the winter, we hear about number of flu deaths going up and down, but we didn't really hear anything because it didn't have a big effect. So there, anticipating maybe we'll see a little bit more flu because people are putting their guard down a little bit more now. So we'll see, we'll see what that means. If every year something mutates or if we don't see that crossing of species with these exotic flus over many years, what that means is that we haven't had an interaction with it, which means that we don't have memory cells for it. And so that's why when one of these exotic flus, like the swine flu, swine flu or the avian flu crosses a species barrier and starts to affect humans, then you could see it spread rampantly, just like what we saw with COVID, right? The coronavirus. 
because your body then, when it's introduced to this new kind of flu, you have to go through that full blown immune response. Some people's immune response, because they have no memory, and plus it's come from a different species, we could see that in a few weeks, it actually starts to not only cause you to have a really bad flu, but it can kill many people. So I think it was about what, 10 years ago, uh, the, I can't remember if it was, a, no, I can't remember if it was swine flu or the avian flu, which one just like ripped through the world. And the people who were for some reason more susceptible were people in their late teens and in their 20s. So your age range. and. Um, many people were in the hospital of that age range for like a month. So it just depends on the virus. Okay, so a little bit more specific. Avian flu, avian meaning bird flu. The code name is H5N1-1918. Killed more than 50 people, 50 million people worldwide. We're not there yet with COVID even. So 1997, Hong Kong started there, affected 18 people, six people died. Chickens are birds. So it started out with infected chickens. In Hong Kong, they said, let's kill all the chickens. But a lot of times what happens is then they get shipped already to other countries. So it's still spread to local countries too, there, and came back again, kind of went down in numbers in 2012. So there, here's where it, um, 608 confirmed cases, human cases were fatal. For some reason, mutated to be less efficient, effective. So we haven't really heard much from it. There's always scientists studying all of these exotic flus to see what might happen next. So even though we don't hear about it, there are people who know so much about these exotic flus. Why don't we hear about it? Well, there's always worry that if some terrorist group read about it, found out the lab that it's being studied in, got a hold of it, they could spread it and use it as a bioterrorism agent. So there are people studying all of these things. We just don't know what's going on or where it's happening. All right, swine flu H1N1. Here's another case, human genes, bird flu genes, pig genes. Here's another year, 20, 2009, 2010. Here's another case of, you can get some protection from the annual flu vaccine. I'm not sure why we don't talk about this and maybe it's just to kind of not spread fear amongst people, but even I have friends who say, oh, I don't, I never get the flu, so I don't get the flu shot. And then I always say, well, you're lucky, right? Like, especially COVID, we, you know, it's all, you can walk around without a mask this whole time, be indoors with a lot of people and just have lucked out to not get it. Is it increasing your chances every interaction? Absolutely. So, you know, when we have like, like Haley and Jake who are medical professionals right now, it's like, would you guys walk around without a mask on at work? <laughs> because you're seeing a lot more people in your job. So um, could they have not worn a mask this whole time and not gotten it? Maybe, but it just increases your chances exponentially, right? So when I've talked to friends who say, well, I don't get the flu shot, and I always say, well, it's not a bad idea because the exotic flus, there are some human factors in there, some human flu that you might want to get to have a little bit of that memory that could help in case you got these. And um, then they say, I don't, I didn't know that. So we don't really hear about it, but not a bad idea. 
So as I mentioned, HIV AIDS, HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus causes the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. It not only, you know, oftentimes when we talk about HIV or AIDS, they say, well, it attacks the immune system. Specifically, it attacks the T helper cells. And so the T helper cells, if you remember from last time, they're there to give boosts to the cytotoxic T cells who are doing the major work of fighting off infection that are T cell based. So viruses, as well as cancer cells. So if you don't have these, your immune system, it's kind of sluggish and it doesn't do an efficient job. If you have a virus that attacks specifically those, then you've got an infectious agent who's telling your immune system, don't worry about it, right? So this is a very um, overwhelming issue for someone's body. So there's been lots and lots and lots of programs, not only in the US, but worldwide, because this is a worldwide issue. And many, many people have died and become infected. It's still, to this day, a big problem. There are immuno uh, boosting drugs that help out those T helper cells. They're expensive though. So there's just a lot of this is a this especially is a big political issue because there's again a lack of education about spreading this. Um, the HIV virus is spread by blood to blood contact. So it is a very big issue with people who are drug addicts, specifically um, anyone who shares needles. Because if you're putting all of your money into a drug intravenous that you use needles, um, you're, you really are focusing in that addiction of you want to buy the drug, but do you want to keep spending money on needles? So you might use needles over and over again. If you have it, you might give yourself some and give someone else some, and so that you're sharing needles there. And so that it can be spread very easily that if I'm injecting and then I pull it out, there's a little bit of my blood on there. If I have HIV, I'm giving it to the next person and the next person. Um, the other way that it's commonly spread is through intercourse, that there can be a blood to blood connection. If there's a little bit of tearing of tissue, during that it can be spread. So those are the two main ways that it's spread. But with a lack of education,